спрашиваю по-русски. I actually read Russian in school for one year, but I'm, I'm not gonna try that. So anyway, thanks for having me. Uh, it's also, I um, uh, admire your stamina. I know it's quite late in the day. I just came from the flight, so I'm, I'm like fresh and, and, and just re well rested, but you've been here for the whole day. But I'll try to be brief. If there's um, anything that doesn't make sense, please feel free to raise your hand or something like I can try to do it again, but there will be also be like a, a Q&A session in the end of it. So, yeah. So, um, I normally don't talk about this subject. This is like the first time I'm gonna talk about it, so bear with me. Uh, but I, I, I feel strongly about it because I, it's something I've been doing not not like planned, but it's been part of my whole career within games. And that's how to build uh, a team or a studio. Normally I talk about more like production related stuff, like how you plan a pro project or what you should think about when you do Q&A or outsource or how we want to see the pitches that have been sent to Raw Fury. But um, this is, is a subject that I feel a lot for. So um, I'm, really, I'm really excited about this. And, but it's the first time I have it. So yeah, we'll see how it goes. We start with a little introductions. Then I'm actually, what I want to do is I want to take you through the whole, um, one could say career of a studio called Fat Shark that I was part of starting 13 years ago. And we start like from where we started up until where we are right now. So that's that's like the that, that's gonna be the the red line of the of the presentation. And after that I'll talk a little bit like things I wanna highlight from my talk, what I think is important lessons, and then I'm super happy to, to answer any questions you might have. And also, feel free to interrupt me. So a little bit, oh, that's me. That's my dog, uh, called Yoshi, of course. So I worked 14 years as a producer. Uh, I said 13, it normally you, but I, f I think it's like, actually, this month is 14 years ago that I started with a, in a company. We, we were not called Fat Shark at that time. Uh, it was called North Play. We started in a, in a cellar, like many else doing, in Stockholm, doing that game. I didn't know a lot about games production at that time. I still learn tons of new stuff every day. That's what I love with games. And it was, uh, what, that's what I love with games development. That's such a, like if you look, on the industry today compared for like just two years ago or five years ago or 13 years ago is such a big difference and it's just never getting you you never get bored when you work with games ah, you know all this uh, just before Christmas I felt that I want to try something new because I've been with the same company for 14 years so I decided to join Raw Fury which is a publisher that's been around for three years, based in Star Stockholm, Sweden, but we have people working from all over the world. Uh, so that's where I'm now. My role is a game producer, meaning that I work with different dev teams around the world, helping them with the games, helping them with the teams, helping them with, well, most things. If they feel they have anxiety over something, or if they feel really happy about something, or we just meet up at the conventions and have a beer or two. So this is uh, some of the titles I've been working on, both on Fat Shock and Raw Fury. I'll, I'm the producer at Vermintide, Vermintide 2. I'm the producer for Sable, which is a game that's not released yet, come from Raw Fury. Uh, I'm the producer for Mosaic, which we released last Thursday. That's why I only came today and not yesterday, because I had to rest a little bit, because I was a quite hectic release. 
I'm the, yeah, I, long time ago I used to be the producer of Bionic Commando Rearmed 2, <laughs> Crater, West of Dead, and there's more titles of, of that. So, I've been doing a few games, or been part of doing it. But I'm also, um, well, I don't know, angel investor sounds so good, but I like to help teams. Uh, I got some money from my time at Fat Shark, so I helped a few students up in the northern part of Sweden to set up a studio called Limit Break Studio, and s trying to support them with advice and, and making sure they do take the right decisions. I'm part of a startup called Cold Pixel, which is a game marketing company gearing towards indies because marketing is something indie studios need to be better at or need to do or need to find someone to do it for it. And it's not always the case. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. I'm also very involved in a something called the Arctic Game Lab, which is an is a, is a, is a incubation game cluster thing happening up in the northern part of Sweden right now. That's quite exciting. Uh, it's a few towns that's cooperating to get things, to things happening. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Now let's talk a little bit about Raw Fury. Raw Fury is the reason why I'm here. So Raw Fury is a uh, they call it the unpublisher, but I mean, just to make it simple, it's a publisher of games. This is the probably the most known game. How many knew of you knew about Kingdom? We need to be better at our awareness. We need to be more present. But it's good. It was like seven, eight. So this is a, I mean, this is quite, a lot of Raw Fury's games are quite retro inspired, pixel art, very beautiful. This game, I love it. I'm not the producer for it, so I can say I love it, or I can say I love even producing games. But uh, this is a what you, uh, management city building type of strategy game, really slow paced with a beautiful soundtrack and just fantastic graphics. I can recommend it warmly. Uh, but we also do other games. This is a old twitchy platformer game, uh, sort of roguelike called Garner, very arty, very nice, cute, and super fun. Uh, Dandara, like Metroidvania type of game, uh, pixel art, also very beautiful, from Brazil, which is, with, we like to work with not only like Swedish or Europeans or American developers, we like to work with developers from all around the world. Chile, Brazil, Sweden, uh, I'm supposed to be able to say a lot of countries now to do a good example. I, my head is a little bit too tired for that. But yeah, we like to work with people, like developers from all around the world. It's not, we not have a st portfolio strategy that's going towards a region. The only thing we care about when we, oh, did I go to, the only thing I care, we care about when we sign a game is that we feel something for it. It has to speak to us be very emotional in that sense. We tend to put the business side of games, that's obviously the next thing you do after you, when you decide to see if you can sign a game, to see if there's any business reasoning behind it. But first thing, for us to be able to do a good job, we need to feel for the game and understand it and really understand what the developer wanna do, say with the game. So this is a game we uh, announced at the XO19 event in London two, two, three weeks ago, West of Dead, which is uh, a really cool looking, like, comical style, Wild West, rogue, roguelite, twin stick shooter, 360 cover game. <laughs> As well. And Mosaic, which we released last Thursday, which is a dystopian, not a dystopian, but it's a, it's a comment about modern lives and society. And you can view it as a dystopian or you can view it as a, as a, as a rebellion or something. Uh, it's a story-driven narrative game. So you can see there's really no pattern to the games we're signing. Where West of Dead is like a skill-based, roguelike game with a long, large, strong community focus, while Mosaic is a three-hour, very 
artistic narrative experience, which you probably just gonna play once. These are the th that one is made in Norway. So that's a little bit about our, I mean, w obviously we have a few more games. We've been around for three years, so I think we have like 12, 12 titles released so far. Uh, I mean, there's a lot, you can say a lot about how a company works, but if I'm gonna pinpoint a few things here, it's uh, compassionate support and for us, in you know, I mean, why I'm I'm here today because we we want to support the, the, the game development society, like community, in any way. So I can come here and and like share our knowledge from stuff, and hopefully you will come somewhere and start sharing knowledge. I mean, we think we we love to share what we learned, and we love to learn from others what they learn. So going to events, being present in like. Wherever you, you find developers, game developers, we want to be there uh, as, a, as, a, as a partner. When we work with the uh, games or developers, we call it sensible input. It's, it's we don't choke people with our feedback or requests. We, are, we t try to have a dialogue with our developers. So the first thing when we sign a game is to understand what do you want, what do you want to do with your game? What's your vision? What's your reasoning behind it? And once you understand that, you can start having a discussion about things. But you never find us saying like, you have to do this, you have to implement like monetization in one way, you have to have a DLC, or you have to do something. We can just discuss around it, maybe highlight things based on experience, we think this might be good. So that's a sensible input. It's a shared risk, meaning that we we go into a project together. We'll probably go in, invest a few money in it. But you know, once we invested in the title, we're not gonna cut the funds just to see the title, just to see the studio disappear, and we can have the IP afterwards because we don't own any own any IP, like. We actually own one now because we bought it. But our 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 deals are not made on. We never ask for the IP. We just invest in the project, and we take a shared risk on the funding, and that's all. So you don't have to come back to us with a sequel. You don't have to promise our us your next game or anything. It's our hope is that you will come back to us because you find find us so good that you don't want to work with someone else but us. And so far it's been quite successful. Obviously we provide funding when needed and we try to be very, very transparent on how that funding is used. The dev developer always had the final say on how cost is going to be used. So we don't have like a um, overhead marketing spend budget that is not really specified. Like if we go to an event, you will know on every everything that costed money, and we will ask you like, you want to do this or you want to do that, because in the end, it's your money that you borrow from us. A lot of devs tend to think, and that's important. If you ever get a publishing deal and you get like that money up front, you feel like oh, okay, so they gave me their money, but they didn't give you your money. Uh, their money, they gave you your money because they're gonna make that money from your game and your idea. So, and that's a quite important thing to remember. It's not, it's your game that's gonna make all this money. So the funding is just a tool for that. And also it's a partnership. So we like to see the team grow or be as it is, if, they, if that's what they're happy with. But we like to see the team to thrive, to be, to be happy. So not only the game, but also the team. If we can help in any way, or if, if, if you ever get into economical, financial problems, we will try to help out. Because we don't like to see developers have to close down the, the shop just because we didn't support them. So that's Raw Fury. 
I tend to get this question a lot. It's like if we wanna if I wanna pitch my game to you, where should I how do I do it? Best thing is to send it to this email address. And there's a, if you go to our website, rawfury.com, there's a little section there which is good to know on what we expect from that pitch. Like we expect a playable build, would like a budget like an overview, like some vision, some info on the team. But you can read about everything on that website. That's the best way to pitch the game. I mean, I'm happy to take on a pitch here, but I can't, I can't, what I will do is I will ask you to send it to this place because the whole company reviews all pitches. I can't take any decision here on if the game is going to be signed or not. I'm happy to discuss it and come with feedback though. So, yeah. That was everything about Raw Fury, which is they they brought me here, so now you know a little bit about Raw Fury. But now I'm actually gonna talk about like this presentation was really about, which is this company called Fat Shark, which is my old company, and how they started and where they are today, and what I and they and we all can learn from that. So uh yeah, Fat Shark started, I call it the seller years, it's, it's about yeah 14 years ago. Uh, we did, we started with like, we had a massive project, an MMO, not an RPG, but MMO RTS. It was, MMOs was really big at that time. Uh, we, we eventually, we, we started uh, like five developers, eventually we grew up to eight developers on that initial couple of years. Uh, we did get money in because we did casino games, or the port for casino games. And that's an important thing which I think if you start, whenever you decide to start a studio, if you have like, I mean you might build that around an idea of an IP and you might even get uh, be able to get funding to develop that IP, but it's still I think it's depending on your experience. If you if you use the new form team, try to get some work for higher thing as well going because that's it's a really good way to to sort of build your team in a in a in an environment where you actually gain money into the company instead of spending it out. Because if you if you get that money, if you start working on that IP that you've been having ideas about for so long. The risk is quite big that you're going to take wrong turns all over the place because you also have to focus on building the team. You also have to focus on getting funding and getting like educating and all those stuff. So yeah, it's, I think it's really good to not just start developing your own. It doesn't matter how good it is. I, I'm, I'm sure it's really good. So that's like when we started, I think we started with a nice setup of Team, it depends on what you want to do. Obviously, you can do one man or two man shows, but I'm talking about like if you want to build a team, stay for this numbers quite a long time if you can. I mean, if you get a lot of work for highest that's just coming in, that's good. But main, make sure to maintain focus and not just expanding for expansion. So I think that we did good. The yellow ones are, it was supposed to be some kind of animation, I didn't really get it right, but anyway. The yellow ones are things we didn't do good. And I think it's really easy for a, for someone that, if you're just starting up, these are things that are gonna be problematic. Scope, obviously, scoping of a, of a project. For us, we, I mean, just the fact that we decided to do an MMO, the first thing <laughs> we're gonna do with five devs, Already there, there's a lot of alarm signals like, no, don't do an MMO as your first game because you're going to have to do multiplayer. You're going to have to do, like, well, we're also going to do it in our own engine. And what, I mean, we were so away on the scope. Try to find something, if, for your first IP, try to find a scope that's sort of manageable. We didn't. I mean, we, we, we survived, anyway, but that game, ne that game never, never came out. It's still just an idea. There's a lot of loose pieces around it, but there's, n there's nothing released. We also failed in, like, I think it's quite... 
depending on how you set things up. But if you start working with people doing work for hire and also work on this, your own IP, it's really important that you find a way to in, uh, engage everyone in the same thing because obviously the, the, the own IP will probably be more interesting for people and that's where you want everyone want to be there. But try to find ways to get everyone involved. Like have evaluation of that game. Even though someone is sitting on that boring work for hire project for someone else, they still contribute to the company. So try to have them involved like with feedback or ideas. Have like work they set aside where everyone is working on the IP. I think that's something that's really important. We failed in that, so that's also the reason why this game never came out. Because half of the team were focusing on getting money into the company on work for hire, and they didn't really, they were not invested in the IP. While the other team was just so focused on that and just felt like we'd never have any resources because everyone else is just out working on other places. And also, like the last point here, and I'll try to explain it because it's a bit vague. It's like we started this, the IP idea we had, like this MMO, it was based on an idea or a dream that we, oh, this is going to be so cool and we really want to do it. And it's like, when you start having ideas about things going to be cool and I want to do this and it's, oh, what if we're going to do this? Rather than having, which is like assumption, this would be really cool, rather than looking at opportunities. And it, it, it's a boring, very business-like, but you need to look at the market. You need to look, it's like, is there, is there something out there that's missing that we can offer? Or did we get like an... Uh, did the publisher come and approach us and ask for, for a specific type of game or a game mode or whatever? I mean, if you don't have an opportunity out there, chances are quite big that you're going to uh, not be able to release the game. Or if you release it, it's going to fail because there's just so many games out there. So you need, you need like a really good, like, well, a splendid idea to make it stand out. But even if it's, it's a like, truly unique game experience, if you don't have that opportunity that someone's like, gonna ask, like a publisher ask for, for, or a platform owner, it's difficult. So, and that's a mistake with it. That game never came out. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Offworld, I think. So, but because of this casino money, we managed to build the team, continue to grow, and eventually uh, we started working with Grin, which was uh, well, a lot of people that were Starbreeze were f formerly Grin. They did the uh, Ghost Recon uh, simulator, they did Bionic Commando, they did Terminator. A lot. But unfortunately they had to close down the shop at 2010, I think due to mismanagement. Uh, but we were subcontractors for them and everything was pretty cool. We were managed, we, because of that we were like, all the team were working on one project, a AAA project, we were doing Terminator, actually the rail sequence of Terminator Salvation. And everyone was, yeah, it's cool. License game, well, it is what it is, but still, we were really happy. We were got new, new, were able to hire level designers, visual effects artists, uh, getting into the uh, green engine, the diesel engine, and yeah, so everything was well. And the best thing with this part is, we did that game, Terminator Salvation, it wasn't a success, because it was a game that were actually, there were different parts, we, we were one studio, and there was another studio in Gothenburg, and there was another studio, like main green studio in Stockholm, and all of them were like just put together quite hastily and said like do this AAA game with really short amount of time, tons of money. Every time we said like we don't have time, they just throw more money on us and said like hire more people, and it's not really working like that. You can't skip pre-production, not even if you AAA title. So the game wasn't that good. Uh, some people say the rail sequences, which we did, were okay. I don't know, maybe. But I mean, the best thing for us as a team, I'm not talking about IPC, I'm talking about for us as a team, where we managed to survive this year because we, we got paid by Green. 
up until a point so we actually managed to, even when they stopped working, we could go into the next step. And we did that because we had a really good management that took good sound business decisions. And what happened here after Western Dead, uh, no, after Terminator, is that we actually did this opportunity thing. Because when Grin disappeared, they came with us and said, okay, so we can't pay you the last bill, but here, here's a ton of Wild West graphic assets that we have just laying around. And also, by the way, you can have the uh, engine license. So they gave us that because they were gonna go bankrupt anyway. So that gave us an opportunity to create the game. So, and also we got the, uh, the multiplayer part of Bionic Commando was really popular, like the PvP. And we got that network code, so we just took that PvP, slapped on the West, uh, Wild West assets, and we did Lead and Gold, Gangs of the Wild West, which was a fairly successful 4 versus 4 PvP shooter in that we released in 2010, I think. Uh, and we did it really quick, we did it in one year because we had all the graphical assets there. We were less than 20 devs. And what we did good here, like, and that's so important, we found an opportunity. We, had, we never planned to do this Wild West multiplayer PvP game. It was just because we got the assets. We, s we, we stopped thinking about it. And I think that was the key to success. You need to be very open to opportunities and be very flexible or versatile on how to act on it. Because we, we had this MMO still in our minds, but we, we, we forgot, we put that aside and we did this game and it was a success. Unfortunately, one, the one thing we didn't do perfect at that time was we were not confident enough that the game was, was going to be successful. So we decided to go with the publisher very late in the deal, not for financial, like, well, for financial reasons, but we could have taken a gamble and just released it ourselves. And by that, we would keep the IP ourselves and we'll be able to do a sequel. So, well, in hindsight, maybe that would, would have been better. But at that time, we thought it was better to, to sort of play it safe. So it's really hard. Maybe, I mean, Murphy's Law might have said that if we didn't go with the publisher, maybe the game would have failed and the studio wouldn't be around anymore. Uh, also, we did, uh, since we uh, inherited the tech from the diesel engine, it was a perfect time for us to, to develop it in a live environment. Here we started to do a little bit more mistakes. Like we, we have this successful title, we have this really good team that's so uh, capable of uh, capable of, of like creating these uh, multiplayer games. So what we do, we do we do a, a, a puzzle game or a side-scrolling platformer, which is like <laughs> so. St it's so strange, and, and I mean, avoid that. I, if, you find this, if you find yourself being successful or, or like you feel confident in one genre, stay in that genre for a while. Find things that you can sort of variation, but do a sequel. That's when you start be able to do the fun stuff and something like, if you have the tech there, don't reinvent the tech, stay in the genre. But we didn't, we, we started to switch genres and stuff, and none of these games were very successful, unfortunately. But we managed to to stay, uh, I mean, s stay floating due to the sales from Lead and Gold. We learned how to run several projects at the same time, and that's a lot to learn. But if you can do that, that's really good, because a lot of in the devs they they do this first project and they just put everything they have to that thing, and then they release the game, and they just totally exhausted. And now they're supposed to start working on the next team and then you have an art team standing there start doing assets for something you haven't even done a pre-production pre for a prototype. So start thinking like you need to think strategically, not the whole team, but someone of you need to start like putting takeaway devs. Even though it's crunch time and you know everyone needs to be do finishing this game, try to find 
just a few hours to start planning for the next title. Because otherwise you're always going to be like late to the next project. We learned that a lot. Uh, in hindsight, I wish that we cut one of the games. Or actually, we should have cut both games. But we did decided to do Bayona Commando because we thought it was a cool brand. I think that game didn't sell like... <laughs> it's like abysmally bad. It was only released on consoles. And Capcom never decided to support it. Uh, both those games we should have cut before they were released. Because they were... I mean, they now, after 10 years, they might be break even because of sales and stuff. But at that time, no. Uh, also, that time, because we started growing to more devs, we started doing reorganizations, start using new planning or project management tools all the time. And what I took with me from that is like avoid, <laughs> avoid that. Try to don't fix stuff that's not broken, or even if, you, if there's something broken, don't expect just adding a new team member on that, or like, we're gonna have this new tool and everything's gonna be good. Like, uh, we, go, we go from Jira to Asana, everything's gonna be good. It's not really working like that. You need to be very organic. Uh, there's a lesson learned for that later on. You need to be thoughtful on what, what the changes you do. After that, we um, switched Chandra again. <laughs> now we did a top-down RPG. <laughs> uh, but we also went a little bit back. We started to find a, like a little red line or thread between our titles. We actually went with War of the Roses. That we, we was a work for Hive to Paradox. They asked us to do like a Mountain Blade ripoff. But we went back to lead and gold in terms of online PvP. Mul uh, multiplayer only. So, and that was good because then we started to realize that's where our strengths are. And when you come to that insight as a studio, when you can, if someone asks you what, what's, what's your strengths and what's your challenges, if you can answer it directly, you're on a good track. And at this time, I think this is like six years after we started, we started to understand what we can do. Like Fat Shark as a studio, what, where our strengths are. Uh, we also started to, with Creative, with that, that was the first game that we really did self-publishing. And I'm not just saying putting the games up on Steam, because that's the easy part. When I say about self-publishing, it's like the whole go-to-market sequence. Something you normally use a publisher to help you with. Think about the game as a product. Who we're gonna target with it? When are we gonna announce it? How we're gonna announce it? How we're gonna reach players? How which which regions? How we're gonna localization? All those things that um, you need to think about as an in the studio if you're gonna self-publish. And if you, d I mean, if you don't do it yourself, bring someone in, ask a publisher for help, go to a marketing agency for for some of the things. But don't just put it up on Steam. Don't go early access and think like, okay, this might see if it flies, because it's not really, it's too much risk. Uh, another problem with, especially with Krater, or Creator, is the game vision and how difficult it is. If you work on your own IP, never expect the, the vision of the game, you always have to, it's like a, like a reoccurring, Prophecy. You need to tell yourself, tell each other, sync with each other in the team that you still share the vision. We didn't do it, so eventually the game that some of the people that have been taking the decision to start doing the game thought of when we started the project two years after, what came out was something different. They asked for a multiplayer dungeon crawler. We, got, we gave them like a single player <laughs> top-down exploration RPG. So somewhere along the line the vision fell apart and that's super important because if you don't have the vision then you can't because you need to take all the decisions that the vision is important for like the marketing decision and the those things you need to take from the beginning so you need to stay true to that uh, when we s when green were became bankrupt the engine team asked us if we want to fund two of the devs to start working on the next-gen engine, 
the next gen diesel engine. And uh, Fatshark, even though we didn't have a lot of money, instead of putting everything in our own IP, we also invested in that. So this, like four or five years after, paid off really well. Because we were approached by Autodesk that wanted to buy the engine for us for a big sack of money, big sack of gold. And that was really, I mean, it proves like we had, if you sort of believe, if you have someone that's really believe in a product and you sort of, we maintain them all throughout this year, even though there was no real payoff for us because that engine took, took them five years to finish it. But if you, if you have that, but the whole, the, the goal from that point was actually to, this is going to be an engine that we can sell, that we can license. And that's how they developed it. And in the end, it actually turned out to, f to work. And that's what gave us the money to start doing the, the game that actually became Fat Shock's su success, which is the next one. We also started to learn more how, because when we did, uh, like how to use different projects and use parts of a project uh, to, to put them together. So you start thinking modular about game design, and that's something that helped us a lot. We didn't do a network part for one game, we did a network code for one game that we could apply to all different games. The graphical pipe as well. And that's really int yeah, important. We did start t trying out early access with World Vikings. Failed miserable, but we learned a lot. Oh yeah. So this is uh, supposed to be a fancy animation. Didn't happen. <laughs> so this is the game that sort of took Fat Shark to become very successful. And when we decided, we got the money from the BitSquid engine and we decided, okay, we're gonna invest it in something really cool. We, we all, there was several people in the studio that loved the Warhammer IP and really wanna do a game about it, but we didn't know what kind of game. But we looked at the market and at that time was Payday was really big, Payday 2. Um, as well as Left 4 Dead 2 was still really popular. But those games were really old. I think Left 4 Dead was like seven years. So we realized that we, if we just took the Warhammer IP and sort of sma slapped it on a Left 4 Dead game mechanic, we could have something interesting there. And we also decided to uh, add some RPG elements to it. But the, the, the important thing is that we kept it really, the scope was really simple. If you find a game that you sort of can use as a template project, which we did, well, I mean, we, st we stole a lot from Left 4 Dead. That's when things can become really successful, even though the genre, the co-op genre was new for us. We had so many answered, uh, questions answered from Left 4 Dead already when we started. <sighs> and we stayed with that. Uh, um after that, we did finally, after 13 or 10 years, we did a sequel, which has been something that, <laughs> I mean, if you have success, at least set aside a little part of your team to do a sequel, because that's where you can get, like, oh, no, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, where you can get, like, some success. Uh, the team is now, like, 110 developers. That means this, or oh, I was supposed not go there, but I do that anyway, company growing pains. It's really important to have that in mind. And I found out, we found out that if you have that in mind early, things will be easier later on. Things like, we eventually will hire people that's not speaking the same language as yourself as you grow. You start working with outsourcers, or investors come in that want to know. So keep everything to English. No. Ukrainian or Russian comments in the code, keep everything to English, like documentary documents and stuff like that. Same, I mean, we w in the beginning we had to sort of translate everything from Swedish to English, and that was a pain. As well, like com like communication structures and stuff. When you a little team, you can come around long with like no structure, but when you st grow, obviously you need to have those things in mind. I got five minutes left now, so I'm gonna speed up. Uh, now 120 people. 
so this is the Fetchock today, after I left. They about 120 developers. They sold 7 million copies, I think. I'm not, I'm not sure, I don't have the exact numbers on both Vermtide. And they have a really low employee turnaround. So we did learn a lot of things those throughout these years. But there's a lot of things that we could have done better that probably would have taken us quicker from where we were there. And some of those things were things I pointed out in the first part of the talk. So I'm just going to be really quick here. Just go through. This is quite. Th these are the very important things I think. When you start, focus on the team. Rather have a team without an, uh, a cool-looking idea than a, a team with a really bright idea, because the team this itself is 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 the, st the strength of your of of setting up a studio. The, the ideas, the IPs will come afterwards, especially if you have that opportunity. Think. Don't forget marketing. <laughs> Never forget marketing. Whatever you do. Make sure to market yourself, Com how you communicate yourself as a team, how you communicate the products internally, how you, how you set up like the branding of your team to, to others, how your presentations look, how, how, uh, everything. Vision is, uh, the visions are important. Autonomy is king. It's really good to be self-governing, both for the teams, but also when you start, how, how you let people work in the teams, to let them be uh, autonomy, it's, it's, I found out, if you start pinpointing people what they're going to do, things turn sour quite f quickly and not really, you not get the best out of people. So make sure they are autonomous. The power of 50-50 is like if you can sort of mix work for hire with internal IPs. I found that if you can have half of the time on that thing, and then how you divide that time, if you have a hack weeks where you do work on your internal projects, or if you have like one, a couple of days per week, it's up to you. I mean, it's different for per team. 50-50 seems to be like something that gives you the most sustainability of a team, or of a, of a project. At the same time, you can work on your own IPs, where obviously the, be like the great benefits or the, like the great opportunities are, are there. Opportunities. If you start developing developing your own IPs, don't do one IP to the to the finish line. Have several prototypes out. Try to build a portfolio which you can show. When Apple Arcade released, they promised 100 games for release. The marketing team did that. Like the business side realized a couple of months before the release in September that there was no games. They actually went around to a different publisher and like you got any games, they shopped around for games. So if you, if you have that chance to, to if you had, would have had an Apple Arcade game, or an iOS game that wasn't released at that time, you'd be doing great money, big money. So opportunities is like, don't just stare at your own IP, try to be as, have as many, many options as possible. Be organic, don't interfere, and I mean, with that I mean like, don't fix stuff that's not broken, don't just re, restructure the team just because you should do or like now we're going to start using new tech or something be very calm in your changes that's something that worked well for us is that like zero minutes now is it seven o'clock or no we questions if we, if we will have some uh, question and answer yeah, sec okay. section this yeah. th this means that we have to just okay give an opportunity some to yeah i think i mean all of this is mostly just reiterations uh so, yeah. Questions for that? Should we? Yeah, we can do questions. Uh, I think this is might be the last slide. Okay. Oh, this one. Don't forget marketing, marketing, marketing. Yeah. I think I made my point there. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's do some questions then. <laughs>